Okay, we're now being recorded. Uh, Calvert, it's all yours. Hello. Uh, so, uh, continued. Okay. Um, the uh, the issue I've been tackling this week with SES is uh, that we're trying to find. Uh, oh. We're trying oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to. Uh, go, you know, sorry, proceed. I'm going to let uh, Michael Fig know that we're doing this now. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, the I'm trying to come up, I'm trying to create a release of SES that is usable for common JS, ESM, uh, with the native support and node, and also with, uh, the dash R ESM uh, in node, which is apparently a subtly different dialect. I got around, uh, I, I got around the worst of the problems on, on, uh, the, the the difference in the dialect is is this there's this uh, distinction between um, import star as name and just import name um, and uh, resum if you will does not treat that the same way as native ESM um, especially when you have some code bases that are compiled down to a shared common JS form um, and others that are not um, so. The, the question I have for everybody here really is, uh, what do we need um, in order for SES to be usable to all of our um, constituents? Does, uh, do we need to have CommonJS, ESM, and uh, Resum support for, uh, for each of our, all of our use cases? Well, I probably have a, somewhat bitter stance on this after years. Um, we all have a bitter stance on this. <laughs> so uh, in general, everything, everything in the ecosystem except web browsers, uh, but browsers for bundlers, or br bundlers for browsers, uh, support uh, importing common JS files. That's right. Um, and yeah. Every single one of them, uh, as long as you do not set uh, the ES module really odd property on it, will give a default import equivalent to the module.exports value of mm -hmm. a common JS module. Uh, this is the only overlap of all those systems. State, state the overlap again. If you generate a common JS module for your package, whatever, um, it is generally importable everywhere except through native browsers support. Mm -hmm. But if you use a bundler for a browser, it is supported mm -hmm. uh, because bundlers can kind of fiddle with stuff. Um, from there, you have now generated a common JS build. Um, these different things will create a ESM facade around the common JS uh, build. And as long as there does not exist a underscore underscore ES capital M module uh, field with a truthy value, they will generate a default named export for that facade. They may generate more things than that. So when you, when you say a, will, def a default named export. Uh, uh, a export named default. Okay, okay. Um, so, so you, that's so your you overlap. Okay. So In, you, can't, you can't import open curly name, but you can import, you know, name from, which gets the default export. Correct. Okay. That is and the total overlap of all the systems that we what have about, found. What about the other way around? Um, a uh, common JS module doing a require of an ESM module? Uh, that just blows up. Okay, uh, well. in, in some bundlers, it doesn't blow up. Okay. 
So one one thing uh, before I go, I have to go in, in one minute. But before I go, just a, a note on the things that we have been doing. Um, we decide that our transpilation of of um, modules to become uh, secure modules within the locker service. Um, we decide that we're not going to do any special formatting. We're only going to compile from ESM to ESM and let other tools that exist today that are pretty good at producing different outputs for that module do the, the other work. Um, so I wonder why you have a tool that produces multiple outputs, if, if, if that's what I understand that you're doing. Yeah. So part of the problem is a variety of tools, particularly TypeScript generated modules, cannot generate actual ESM. Oh, uh, what? They cannot generate compatible ESM with Node, and there are many outstanding issues and a strong desire of them not to fix them. Oh my uh, God. So the output of the TypeScript compiler is CJS? Uh, yes and no. Um, they can generate a form of ESM, uh, but it is meant to be subsumed by other tools. So I don't, all the code that we do is TypeScript. All the things that we write Correct. is ES modules. All the things that we Correct. compile is um, uh, but from TypeScript to- But if you try to generate an ES module that has any common JS or any other thing that doesn't go through TypeScript, it blows up. There are open issues board. about this. I mean, it, it TypeScript does not work with Node's implementation and they do not desire to fix that. I, I feel that, uh, that that might not be, a, 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 I mean, for, for us certainly it's just that the, the system that we're creating is to compile ES, ES modules, not to compile common JS or any anything else it's just for yes es module itself and our assumption is that if we go get the esm transpile it into another esm that does the secure aspect of it but preserve the shape of the things that you import the things that you export um or the shape of it um and then let other tools to do the work obviously to get to that point to use that transpilation you have to remove the typescript annotations and that becomes a ES module anyways. Sure. And then you transpile that into another ES module and then you transpile that into whatever your system needs, which is common JS or, or ESM or bundle all together in one thing or EFE or what, what, whatever you want. Um, and that works pretty well for us. So that's just a idea that maybe trying to have a tool that produces all these different things with different formats and different semantics is going to be really difficult when uh, doing it only for ES module is probably sufficient. That's just an idea. That's, that's very helpful information. Um, so could I do, um, if there are any transitive dependencies that happen to be common JS of a package that is being used with your system, is, is that supported? We just don't care because whatever you have in the ES module is what you're going to get as an input and you will produce another ES module. Someone else will have to figure out how to do that connection with a common JS that you are importing. So it's some, that, somewhere down the pipeline, somebody has, if, if any of your transitive dependencies are common JS, it's up to them to export, uh, is, is to provide an ESM equivalent? Uh, it depends. Like in, in our case, most of the time we use a rollup uh, configuration in the app. And so we compile the code from ESM to ESM with the security guarantees that we add into that new module. And then we fit that into the pipeline and the pipeline will get bundle everything together. If there is a dependency that I'm importing that happens to be a common JS, the rollup will do the dance of looking into the package. Is it really a thing that was compiled that has the, what, what Bradley was saying, the, the Capital, uh, what's the name? The ES or module? Yeah, the ES module tag. Yeah, it does all the dance for that, and then it, at the end of the day, these down down the road tools will take care of that part of the conversation. Uh, we just don't care. We only focus on 
getting the module and producing the module that is secure. So um, I know that Brian um, uh, had tried to just, you know, had, 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 you know, we'd read the spec on how node, the node coexistence of common JS and ESM without the minus R, just the, the, the native support. Uh, and Brian thought through what would be required to convert uh, the Agora code base uh, uh, over to that. And he ended up with some gotchas that, um, that prevented us from doing it, uh, that seemed to require that there was some, uh, the way he put it was, there's some constraints where you that say you have to fix things in a bottom up order. And there's other constraints that say you have to fix things in a top down order. So the two sets of constraints together mean that you have to fix all of the codes simultaneously and atomically in order to get to a new working state. Um, and uh, do, um, does anybody here, in particular the people who work with Brian on that, uh, Michael or Chip uh, or Calbert, uh, understand what those constraints are and why we ran into difficulties there? Oh, I, I do not know all of those constraints. Uh, I think uh, what Brad was just saying about um, there being a very narrow intersection as to what is interoperable is most likely accurate. There are a great number of things that are, uh, there are a great number of import forms above and below that, um, that any of your third party modules might be using on any of our, in, in any of our own modules that might be using, um, which, which is probably where that, which is, which is probably why um, Brian ran into that problem. But I, I, I will listen to Chip and Mike, uh, Michael at this point, I'm, I don't know. Yeah, the, there were a couple of things. Um, the one, well, I started going down this road and then I just, okay, this is not on my critical path and <laughs> headed off to, to, to Brian. But um, there's there's some, some piddly stuff like um, uh, when you do an import, whether you have to have the, the, the .js on the end of the, the name of the thing you're importing versus you're not allowed to have the .js on the end of the thing you're importing. Um, but the main issue, as I recall, was that you just couldn't, um, if, if, if you, if you told node that this, 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 this module is a, this package is a module, um, it has type module, then you can't import from, um, if the thing you want to, to, to import is um, a um, uses ESM, that's fine. But if it's coded in ESM syntax, but it's being actually realized using resum, then, then you cannot. Um, if it is coded using require in a CJS, you can you can you can import it, but but then you can't use resume with it. And so we have to either, you basically you have to either go all in for, for ESM or go all in for resume or go all in for CJS. And it just, in, in um, a single repo, it's, it's kind of an all or nothing kind of deal. And that makes it a sort of not exactly a boil the ocean problem, but it makes it a, um, uh, something where you have to do a large global um, uh, change rather than simply, you know, I will, I'll fix this module and then I'll fix this module and then I'll fix this module. Yeah, there isn't a gradual migration story, um, at least between um, RISM and ESM. I would yeah. agree with that statement. So there was an older package called STD for standard slash ESM uh, that was more compliant. Um, it, it is capable of, uh, for the most part, being interoperable node. Um, unfortunately, due to it not acting like TypeScript or Babel, it was significantly less popular and uh, just ESM without any 
uh, qualifier was created. Yeah, the, the issue is that the ESM package is, um, is applied globally um, as opposed to provide, applied selectively to particular um, uh, modules that you load. Um, yes, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't observe dis distinctions that are marked in the package, Jason. Right. So perhaps, um, perhaps Chip, the, that, that's, the, that's the key insight that maybe the issue here is that we need to um, engage with the ESM project to make it yeah. more. Oh, there's Michael. Yeah. So, yeah, so ESM actually does hand, have handling for .mjs that was based off of what node, nodes handling was. Um, so my understanding is that if we used MJS, then it would should interoperate. But maybe it just needs to be taught how to do type module, and maybe that hasn't been done yet. Because I, I think JDD was uh, was amenable to making it work in such a way that it was compatible, and he was careful to do it only so that it only supported the features that Node was going to support. Um, but it's very possible that this just hasn't been done yet because the Node mm -hmm. support is fairly new. Okay, um, I think that I can close this topic out then for now. Um, perhaps I'll follow up with the ESM project to see where they are on that feature. Um, this may be this may not be an existential problem for a migration. It might be that we can do an ESM to a resin to ESM migration at some point. Um, I still don't know about, I, I think Brad's point still probably applies for a common JS2 ESM migration, that there's a narrow set of import forms that will be usable going forward. But uh, I think oh. at, at least then it'll be a bottom, uh, a bottom up transition and not both a <laughs> bottom up and top down. Yes, it's significantly easier if you start with a common JS code base rather than a transpiled code base. Um, there's one thing you probably also want. Uh, we have unflagged and removed all the warnings for what are called conditional exports, so you can ship both builds. Um, tooling for that isn't great. But I mean, a lot of the stuff that Node's done has been over years and tooling adopted their own um, solutions in the meantime, they don't overlap. What is a conditional export? So the concept was whenever you have a call site that's performing some sort of import operation, whatever it is, require import, who knows what the next one will be. Um, <coughs> Um, node sets essentially a bunch of Boolean flags. It's roughly making a state machine uh, where in your package uh, you can define what paths get uh, resolved to specifiers within a package. Um, so it's kind of the corollary to an import map. So if you import something, for example, the import condition becomes active. Uh, if you require something, the require condition becomes active. And then in your listed mappings in your package JSON, it will go and resolve against those specifiers. So if I import, let's say, SES slash internals, and it's not in the mapping, it will fail. Or if I were to import SES slash common JS, it could see in, or just SES. Uh, if I import just SES, you can inside your package JSON have the route for import map to ESM.js or MJS. Um, and you could have the route for require uh, map to uh, common JS, .cjs or JS. Um, mm -hmm. So essentially, this is a way of handling the problem of people with poly packages that are shipping multiple kinds of distros in them uh, that we ended up going with this route, which is quite different from the alternative solution that we saw in the ecosystem. Um, the ecosystem route is generally you just keep adding named fields like module, JS next main, 
TypeScript to your package JSON as one-to-one -one mappings. And so this is instead a hierarchy of conditions. Um, yeah, and the, the so-called conditional exports, um, again, are expressed as a mapping in, in your package JSON. Uh, my end, it, am I correct that ESM or RISM, if you will, doesn't implement this feature? To my knowledge, it does not. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it sounds like we've quiesced on this topic and we yep. should go on to import hooks. Yep. Okay. Michael Hunter, you're on. Okay. Um, yeah. So following the meeting two weeks ago, um, I I created, well, I had a look into the, the specification for um, uh, for the import behavior, particularly looking at the, uh, the, the dynamic versus static import. So using the import expression versus the uh, import declaration. And the, the question we're trying to resolve is, um, if, if the input hooks are invoked and we have an asynchronous and a synchronous import hook on the compartment, let me, let me clarify that. Um, what is the behavior if, uh, if code within the compartment performs both a static and a dynamic, uh, import of the same module? Um, so, and then those could possibly happen simultaneously that you can perform a dynamic import and while that's processing, perform a static import. So the question was around how that should behave. Um, and I looked into the, the, the 262 specification and um, trying to understand how, that, how that's done currently for real hosts as opposed to emulated hosts using the compartment API. And my understanding from the real hosts, from the, from the 262 specification, is that if, uh, if an asynchronous import is um, started and then a synchronous import occurs while that asynchronous import is pending, um, the module the module that gets cached essentially in the um, in the in the memoized, uh, memoization table will be the synchronous import, assuming that the synchronous import is successful. Um, the uh, when the asynchronous import completes when it resolves, which may be around the same time, if, depending on the implementation of the host, um, the because of the way that it's specified, whatever it resolves to will not actually be used. It will use oh. the, the synchronous import, uh, the, the memoized version. That's my understanding from the specification. Okay. I don't know if anyone yeah. else, yeah. yeah I don't, I, so I don't, have any, I, don't, I don't have any opinion about what the specification says because I've, I've never actually looked into that. Uh, it, this, this resolution, of the question is adequate in the sense that compartments, I think, can adopt it with no, with no conflict into the meaning of the import host hooks. Um, uh, it's not my favorite resolution of those that we could use, but it's, it's an adequate resolution. Yes, I agree. Um, yeah, it does have some downsides. So what is your favorite re resolution in that case? Uh, my favorite resolution is that when um, a uh, when a asynchronous uh, answer is requested, that the synchronous hook is is well. First of all, the ca the cache is all is always consulted first. Um, but assuming the cache misses, then the synchronous import is called, and if the synchronous import answers right then. Uh, then um, uh, that gets used immediately and cached. I'm going to say memo, not cache, because the cache, it's not a heuristic thing. It's got to be um, yeah. a, something that can't lose memory because um, uh, it has to guarantee that, that the hook, every hook is only asked 
any question it most wants. Um, uh, if the um, if if the synchronous hook is called and does not give a synchronous answer, where what you're looking for is an asynchronous answer, if the if the if you don't get a synchronous answer, then the absence of a synchronous answer itself should be remembered. And now the asynchronous hook is called, and uh, and the asynchronous hook, whatever it produces as the answer becomes the answer that's used for the asynchronous question. Uh, and it gets memoized so that after that happens, it's also used to answer synchronous questions. But basically the, the, the thing that, resol that you know, sort of resolves the dilemma for me is that the synchronous, la the synchronous absence of an answer uh, is itself memoized, so that the so that if the uh, if it says no synchronous answer from the hook, that the, that the synchronous hook is never asked that question again. Um, I, I think that uh, the the form that uh, that comes to my mind most clearly is that conceptually, um, an asynchronous import is implemented in terms of the synchronous import. And the only portion of an asynchronous import that is in fact asynchronous is the transitive load of your dependencies. Um, so uh, my, my notion is that every synchronous import monotonically advances the set of instantiated modules, right? And because it's synchronous, that this is guaranteed to um, occur in a single event, right? So every time you call import now or, or whatever it's called, or e even if it's not even exposed in the public API, um, there's a possibility of instantiating more um, module namespaces, um, which you will only do months once for each for each module identifier. So the 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 hooks that we're talking about, just to, to uh... Uh, be clear, the hooks that we're talking about as distinct from the hooks in the spec mm -hmm. uh, don't produce module instances and therefore don't produce module namespaces. Uh, the, the hooks produce module static records. Mm -hmm. uh, and the memo that, it, they, that the hooks feed into is a memo from a full specifier to module static record. Yes, okay. Um, uh, uh, but I, so I, on the synchronous side, I think what you said and what I said are in agreement, but yes. uh, the interesting thing is on the asynchronous side. I see, I see. Um, yeah, uh, that, that being the case, uh, the previous implementations of module loaders I've written have always um, erred on the side of having an internal memo, not just of the result, but of the operation to obtain that result. Um, so if you attempted to load, if you attempted to load uh, a module for a particular location, um, the hook would only be called once, like you say, um, because there's a memo of the location to the promise for the static, uh, for the static record, which gets consulted first. That is well, the, the hook from the all right. Okay. So, right. If the if if in the well the in order to be able to answer some questions synchronously, I'm, I'm assuming that there's an exposed synchronous API, which is itself controversial. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but assuming that, then uh, for the synchronous one, the relevant hook would be the synchronous hook, and the relevant memo entries would be the uh, entries that go directly to a module static record, not through a promise. That's right. Okay. What, yeah. uh, what do we expect the uh, behavior to be in the case where a module is not available uh, synchronously? If you perform uh, well in, this, in this hypothetical design of the API, if you perform a, an asynchronous import and it triggers the synchronous hook, which then fails, well, it d does not find a, a module, and then the asynchronous hook is fired, and we have a promise that's pending, and then 
before that promise is resolved, we have uh, the code now perform another synchronous import. What what is the what what happens in the case of a synchronous import with a memoized promise? I'm so familiar with I, this. I, my preferred answer is it fails. Yes. Um, because uh, a synchronous request uh, has to be answered with success or failure now, and it clearly cannot be answered with success now. Well, the, there's a gotcha here where the, the problem is observability of the state of a promise has been regarded as something that we wish to protect and prevent synchronous access to. Um, in particular, if you do an asynchronous import and you attach handlers, they should be executed before anything else uh, uh, is able to access that value. This has been discussed a few times as being quite important. Um, the ability to attach uh, a function that has right of first access to a value. So I, I'm going to say it would be impossible to get a semantic where it doesn't fail because the, uh, the I, I synchronous import is going to expose some state by nature of reifying the value before the promise handlers are able okay. to have right of first access. Okay, let, let, me, let me refine what I'm saying because I don't think what, I, I think what I mean is not incompatible with that, although I realize that what, the way I said it is incompatible. Um, that uh, in the case where the asynchronous hook is called and you, mem you memoize a, a binding from the full specifier to the promise that at the same time you do that, or you know, the same time the internal mechanism does that, the internal mechanism effectively does a dot then on that promise. Uh, and the, so when we talk about the, the hook eventually succeeding, uh, it's when the dot, the dot then uh, on that promise that was installed by this mechanism uh, fires with the, um, the callback argument being the module static record. At that point uh, in the memo table, the, um, the mapping from uh, full specifier to promise is replaced with a mapping from full specifier to module static record. And once that's replaced, then without contradiction, uh, a later synchronous request can be synchronously accessed without violating this, this, um, uh, this aspect of promise semantics. That makes sense. Um, what is the, uh, do, does anyone know when this interacts with, well, with, when imports interact with top level await, what the expected semantics of a, um, a static import of a module that essentially uh, the exports of that module are not known until, or are they uh, top level await? No, you know the module static record synchronously with top level awaits, is that right? Yes. Um, if it's a local any, module. Um, you always know the export binding names um, right. when you create something. So there's, there's not a problem there. Uh, in fact, you check the entire module graph before you do anything. So the linkage occurs before any top level await can happen. Okay, that makes sense. Um, um, if Stu wants hmm. to change that behavior, but it's unlikely it's possible to change. The change is too visible. What does hmm. he want to change it to? Uh, so there's an old document that has been brought up a few times on host implementations called the ASAP evaluation versus out of order evaluation optimizations. Uh, okay. I could probably dig up links to it. Uh, it's from Chrome. Essentially, the idea is 
the way that ES modules are specified currently, they can never be faster than a bundler because they cannot execute chunks as they come in. They must wait for the entire graph to come in. And there are a few different ways you could try to work around this uh, by changing the ECMAScript specification. I'll put this in the chat. Um, so there's a doc. Uh, but it, it is proven not compatible with polyfills in particular. Uh, so they are, they're still working on this. It's been years uh, trying to find a way to get this to work, but uh, they do want it to change. There's just no semantics that are remotely compatible with use cases. So the current semantics is determinism and Shu wants to change it to ASAP? So there's some interesting stuff going on here. Um, the current semantics are not entirely deterministic due to the behavior of top level await and evaluation ordering is now only uh, depth level guaranteed among siblings. Um, oh my. Oh my. Uh, uh, so, hmm. Let's go with Unless you do something weird, it's okay. <laughs> there is a lot of time spent on this. Uh, first tick, whatever you want to call it, uh, the first time your module begins will always be the first time of any of its siblings have begun and they will execute in uh, pre in order traversal. Yes, correct. Uh, as they exist in source text. So okay. essentially the expected order. Um, I'm, uh, I've Rip Van Winkled, I think, four years into the future and top level await was discussed, but I have no idea what the resolution of its behavior was. Uh, if I can okay. ask you okay. all to help me out in understanding this. Let me, let me, uh, my, my, so again, there's uh, so mm, import. If there's a top level weight, importing is the the execution of a, a graph of modules is no longer uh, synchronous. Clearly, um, which is not a problem for the import function, right? because then it's just your execution phase is going to be spread over multiple turns and that promise will resolve or full, will settle um, after your entire transitive import graph is, has uh, executed. That's fine. Does this mean that import statements are implicitly possibly asynchronous? Um, that, that is to say that they implicitly, like the import, the import statement is effectively an await um, implied underneath it because any Correct. of the transitives might await. Correct. Uh, but it is strictly tracked. Uh, so there, there was a need to be able to statically verify if your graph does uh, cause asynchrony. Mm -hmm. So you can actually check a field. Uh, and engines really, really needed to expose that field to hosts. So you can basically check if your uh, graph is able to evaluate synchronously. I see. Do we, are we losing that capability with the um, uh, with the dynamic? Well, with the, the hooks provided to, uh, in the compartment API, uh, we can now no longer statically determine whether a, whether a module is available synchronously or asynchronously. It's just going to, it is available asynchronously if it fails on the synchronous import. Uh, but yes, but that is not for instances, that is for these uh, static module records that are uh, reused right. amongst multiple instances. So yeah. this actually is, is not necessarily related to top level weight because you still must link your full graph okay. before you begin evaluation. Right. Yeah. Uh, Michael Fig. Um, uh, the translation that, uh, that you and I worked on from uh, ECMAScript modules into the, um, uh, you know, the, the um, representation we're using for the shim. Mm -hmm. uh, I, know, I know that uh, when we're working on it together, 
I just completely uh, blew off top level away. I just said, I can't think about that at the same time and I ignored it. Uh, do you have thought, and I don't have any thoughts now about how to upgrade that to deal with top level away. Do you have thoughts on yeah. that? Uh, so I've been talking a little bit with Salah about this and um, the experiment that he did for top level away basically said the top level functor is an async generator. Uh, and then you use yield in certain places at the top level. Um, and that, that gives you enough flexibility to be able to import, implement what uh, top level weight is like. But if you just made it a regular async function, then substituting, if you left the await calls intact, then you don't get the right semantics. Okay. Okay. It's because with the yield, you can drive it at the point that you want to drive it. Precisely. Yeah. Okay. So we might do that rewrite initially and just have a stub uh, top level that doesn't do anything for promises. I don't understand the use of an async generator. Uh, I do understand that that would give the caller the ability to di dictate when it resumes. I'm sorry, did you, Michael, did you say async generator or did you just say Async generator. generator. Oh, async sorry, generator. just a generator is probably enough, but yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, what, yeah what, sorry. What I, okay, good. What I heard was generator. Um, yeah, I, I meant that. I, I, I was... Okay. Okay. I misused the term async generator. <laughs> okay. It should right. be because, just generator. Yeah. Because a generator, the yield proceeds synchronously, so you have sort of full control of the resumption semantics. Um, mm -hmm. I think that you might be able to do it with an async function as well if uh, if you convert the import declarations into await imports, right? Uh, yeah, Bradley can talk about this more, but I don't think you can actually implement the semantics that they want. Yeah. Oh. If you made it just an async function. Yeah, there was one, as we were talking about semantics of, uh, of top level await, one of the proposals was that it's basically syntactic sugar for turning your, your module as a whole into an async function, mm -hmm. with the weights just being awaits inside the function. Uh, and that semantics was rejected. And the semantics that was adopted was ones that cannot be translated into that. Which means that That's they're not entirely are, true, but it is extraordinarily complex to do so. Uh, I assume that this means that um, that your top level function does not proceed serially. Uh, the, it does not. Right. The top level function, the execution stops at await points. The only interleavings in ex on execution are still marked with a weight. It cannot interleave anywhere other than at await points. But you can have multiple await points active at the same time, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Calvert, I, I think that the idea would be if we made our top level functor and a generator, then that would give us the flexibility in the future of translating the await calls into yields. But uh, we can Sorry, talk about that offline. We'll bring it up in an well, issue. What does it mean that you can have multiple await points simultaneously? I think so the implication I, is that every import can uh, cause a new brand, uh, a new, a new branch of execution. Um, uh, so if you import three things that all use top level await, each of those things would uh, be kicked off okay. immediately, and their order is not deterministic. The order is deterministic through the first tick amongst siblings which is very specific. <laughs> which is very specific, but not in the spirit of determinism. <laughs> uh, yes, I, yes. So, so where is this not most precisely documented? Where is this most clearly documented? Um, so in the top level await proposal, it is called variant B. That's what you want to look at. Okay. Uh, there are a few blog posts about variant B. D as in David? Uh, B as in blue. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, so there were three different potential semantics uh, with increasing levels of uh, non-determinism. This has been educational, thank you. <laughs> um, if I could go back to the compartment hooks for a moment. Yes. Um, 
I was proposing another possible solution, and I'm jumping into this a little bit, a little bit blind, so this this may not make uh, this may not be a good idea. But the idea was to combine the synchronous and asynchronous hooks, and just say that the hook can return either a promise or a, or a, an immediate um, module static record, mm. uh, depending on the availability of that resource. And I don't think that's incompatible with the with the um, with the behaviors that we've described so far with two hooks. It would just combine it into one, so you don't have it, it adds a new guarantee that your hook will only ever be called once for a particular um, identifier. Uh, may I ask which hooks specifically? Oh, sorry. The, um, there's an import now hook for synchronous import and a import hook for asynchronous import. Are, are you, These are uh, the hooks provided to the compartment constructor. So the compartment is constructor receive, it, uh, provides an import and import now function and receives an import and import now uh, hook. That's yes. correct. That's uh, correct. And, the, and the, the, so the, the functions it provides uh, provide um, uh, namespaces or promises for namespaces respectively. Um, the hooks it takes in um, uh, 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 provide static records, and it's the compartment that, and it's the static records that get instantiated in the context of this very compartment by the compartment. So essentially, there's the possibility of um, uh, d so the import now method drives the import now hook and the import method drives the import hook or is there overlap? Not, uh, there's overlap. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, it, and it depends exactly on the question that, that Michael Hunter is raising. Um, the way I, the, th the, the overlap that I had in mind uh, was that uh, the import now request, um, first of all, all requests check the memo first, but if the memo misses, then the import now request only goes to the import now hook because you know, whatever, whatever its answer is, that's the only answer you can give now. Mm -hmm. uh, but that the import request would first check the memo. If that misses, then check the synchronous hook. And then only if that misses, go to the asynchronous hook. And as I'm talking this through, uh, I think what Michael Hunter just proposed gives us all the flexibility of and, and expressiveness of the semantics I was thinking in terms of. Which is to say uh, that you only provide an import hook, which may be asynchronous? No, oh, which may be, yes. Yes. So if you ask a synchronous question, if you use the import now request and it calls the hook and the hook provides a promise, then the synchronous request must immediately fail. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that works. Um. There's one difference in external behavior that I can see, and I don't know which way it argues which is um, since the hook can't tell whether a synchronous or asynchronous request was made uh, in uh, Michael Hunter's proposal, um, even if a synchronous request was made, um, the uh, asynchronous activity to eventually yes, would be uh, have off, the thing would be, yeah. would be kicked off. Uh, and in the in the situation, the one that I was talking about, uh, the synchronous request would never invoke the asynchronous hook, and therefore any eventual activity that only the asynchronous hook would kick off would never be engaged. I think that that's sufficient reason to keep the hook separate. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Okay, so. Um, just a side note, 
Today, Sebastian Markvaj, one of the React maintainers, had a similar complaint about only having asynchrony here. Um, you, it might be prudent to go talk to him about this because it feels like he would also like two different kinds of hooks. Um, Good. I have to go, but with that, have fun, everyone. All right. Okay. Bye. Good speaking with you again, Brian. Right. Um, okay, so that that kind of resolves that that uh, question about the the separation of the hooks. Um, I have one other question that came up with the um, on the discussion on this issue on the on the two six two uh, uh, GitHub repository, um, which is just well, it's a bit tangentially related to the issue I raised, but it's a question of where these uh, module static records actually come from. So we, in implementing a hook. How, uh, what is a, what does the module static record look like and how does the implementation get that? Right. There needs to be an additional primitive somewhere. And we haven't really talked yet about where, what the primitive looks like or, or, or what it's attached to. Um, but uh, uh, basically something that takes in module source text and produces a module static record. And because module static records are self-contained, that doesn't do any import walking or, or you know, it's, com it's a completely isolated analysis. Um, doesn't involve any IO. Um, uh, and, um, and then the module static record then becomes the, the data type that's feeding into this other stuff. Um, uh, but that's, that, there needs to be such a primitive to go from, um, uh, uh, source text to this uh, module static record. And in one of okay. Caridi's APIs, uh, he had something, he had a data type called parsed module. And I think that the role of the parsed module data type in Caridi's APIs and the, the role of what I'm calling a module static record is the same. What is the reason not to just um, provide the source text then? If the source text contains all of the information required for this module static record? It contains too much information uh, in that it also contains the source text. Um, uh, so in particular, uh, in, a, um, uh, you know, in an embedded context where you just want to, during development, pre-compile things into static records, uh, and then throw away the source text, you don't want to imply that the source text is available at runtime. Right, okay. Okay, I need to, I get, need to get my head around that because the compartment still needs to evaluate that uh, module from the module static record. So it must have access to the, the contents sure. of the source text in some way. So the, the, um, uh, the thing that, we're, so we're splitting the overall notion of loading into the importer, as we're now calling it. Um, uh, uh, versus the idea that the it can be plugged um, so that um, uh, essentially as a procedural, um, uh, um, so the importer is something that has the, uh, the um, let's see, is the importer the same as the import hook? No, no, I don't think it is. Um, uh, I, mm, why not? I suppose it could be. Uh, Maybe the, l l let me start with that story because then it's a simpler story if it works out and if it doesn't work out, we'll find out. Um, so we've already talked about these import hooks. So the import hooks have to provide a module static record on demand, um, but how they provide it is up to the import hook. So the compartment hook can cause the import hook to load and to load source text and parse it and produce a module static record. And in order to take source text and produce a module static record from it, it might use this additional primitive that we're hypothesizing. But the only thing the compartment sees is that it 
asked for a specifier and it got a module static record, it never sees the source text. But it has implicit access to the information in the source text that's required to evaluate the module. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's some, it has, that, it, that mm -hmm. so the module static record is uh, everything required to, um, uh, okay, I, th I think I might be confused about levels of abstraction here. Um, the compartment as a, uh, you know, as a mechanism to be, imp to be implemented by the machine, which is, you know, the reason why it's a proposal, uh, would be something that, where the module static record is simply uh, the thing that it takes in that, uh, you know, uh, corresponds to the implementation concept of, you know, a pre-compiled module source text uh, that does contain all the information needed to evaluate it. But it only needs to contain the information in a, uh, you know, in a way that the compartment can act on. It doesn't have to be visible through the uh, API surface of the module static record. The module static record can be mostly opaque uh, through its API interface as long as the compartment knows how to instantiate it and link it and evaluate it. Um, okay. The standardized so API that I think it should have is one that exposes what names it imports and what names it exports. But that's it. Okay. So it, it does it, it does implicitly link to say the bytecode or the or the compiled version of the of the source, but it's not exposed through the public interface, as you say, of the module Ex static record. Exactly. Exactly. So in the case of an environment where um, the source text is not available, there would have to be another API not specified here that allows you to resolve from, a, from some kind of module identifier to resolve the module static record in an existing table or something of pre-compiled modules. Is that right? Yes, there's the... Um, uh, uh, I mean, in some sense, the, the import hook itself is the, um, I'm sorry, ask the question again. So um, if, the, if we're proposing a new primitive that allows you to map from source text to module static record, um, but we want this to run in environments where the source text is not available, then there must be another way of accessing oh, oh, module oh. static record. Yeah, I believe that the API that we actually would be using is one that takes module location and um, provides the static record. Um, so well, that, go ahead. So I, I'm at the, the um, I, I, let me let me just speak with regard to the um, the modable situation, which is the concrete case where there's a pre-compile step. Uh, um, such that sources are not available after the pre-compile step. Uh, uh, in that one, uh, there is an out-of-band manifest. Um, uh, and that's not intended to be something that's specified as a standard. Uh, so I suppose... Um, Okay, so 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 so, Calbert, I should I should return back to you because it turned out I didn't have anything substantial substantial to say. Uh, um, yeah, I, I don't think I have anything either. There's, uh, I don't I I think that the API we surface does not necessarily need to um, surface the text of the module. This is just my thought. Um, what is oh, the, oh oh oh. Um, Oh, oh, the the, um, the web browser context, I think, actually helps answer this, which is the code that starts running is running in a start compartment. And the start compartment is set up according to the host. So the start compartment might have uh, in its global, global variables that hold on to host objects like document or file system. Um, uh, 
and uh, it, can, it also has a import environment. So the start compartment is already a working compartment that was somehow provided by the host. Uh, and uh, that would happen uh, in the browser with the Realm API, uh, it's basically turning over to the host how to initialize the start compartment. But then once you're in the start compartment, it's up to the code in the start compartment, how to initialize other compartments. And the um, moddable pre-compilation story is consistent with that, where the start compartment has a fully populated import namespace with all of the pre-compiled modules uh, and um, no runtime ability to populate that name, uh, to, to, um, yeah, to, grow to, that, so. to, to, to create new module static records that did not already exist after that, um, after that T sub zero, after that initial moment. So the initial moment is already one that has a populated import namespace according to the host. Okay, that makes sense. Um, from a, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about in terms of like if I wanted to use the compartment API to, um, for example, to uh, provide a, some kind of membrane interface between the uh, the compartment, uh, the, the code running in the compartment and some other module. Um, and that membrane may be implemented with proxies or something like that. Um, then I wouldn't, uh, am I correct that you wouldn't be using the import hooks at all in that case, you would be using the, the module map pr that provides module instances. Um, in yes. other words, I don't want to, okay, right, okay, right, okay, um, that's good. But then my understanding is clear. Yeah, that, that's, that's why in the modable situation, we can still do the, you know, so much of the security that we're interested in uh, without the ability to create new module static records at one time. Okay. May I, uh, may I carry forward with a concern? Please. I think that, uh, I think that having an import now is going to be regrettable, um, especially because of the top level of weight. Um, and my reasoning for that is that there, uh, it uh, having an, an import now introduces a hazard where working code can be transformed into not working code when any transitive dependency introduces a top level of weight. Um, a, a synchronous satisfaction will always satisfy an asynchronous request, but not yeah. vice versa. Yes, it mean, which, which implies that import now would work, uh, would work in the cases where only in the cases, but would only reliably work in the cases where that, in that module that you're importing has not only been loaded, but executed. And is he, are you talking about the import now hook or the import now uh, API call? On the, uh, the method compartment? of the compartment. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not understanding the scenario. Um, suppose that you have a, a working program that has no top level awaits in its transitive dependency graph. Okay. Um, today, uh, it, it has not been, uh, you ensure that it has been loaded Oh, maybe this is the crux of it. But when, why would you use import now if you know that the module has already been executed? Only uh, to obtain the, the, the export object? The, um, uh, the, the namespace object. Uh, so, so one thing is to get the namespace object, and that's certainly a, a com that will be a common and valid use of it. Uh, and is in fact what you would probably do to do uh, intercompartment linkage for in order to do least authority module linkage. Uh, but the other one that's anticipated, the sort of the one that that um, you know sort of the first use case that motivated it, is uh, you've set up a compartment and now you want to say go. 
and in the, uh, so you want to start execution in there. And the and in that case, you're doing the import now for um, uh, for a module that has not yet been evaluated, um, mm -hmm. and it is causing it to be um, be executed for the first time. Yes, and that that is the case where you have a hazard. And uh, what's the hazard? Suppose that uh, you upgrade one of your transitive dependencies. It doesn't even need to be a shallow dependency. Um, any of your transitive dependencies uh, produces a, a new version that introduces an, a top level of weight. Um, then uh, your import now, which previously would have succeeded because the entire, because the transitive graph could be executed synchronously, can no longer succeed. Uh, okay. If um, I am now confused on the semantics of top level of weight. Well, I may not be clear on what they are at all. Um, if the if the module, if your start module begins execution, and it has no textual awaits in it, mm -hmm. then its its execution must not be split across terms. Is that the case? Uh, um, if, if it's not the case, then something is terribly broken. That doesn't mean it's not the case. We've terribly broken things in the past. Um, Sorry, can you say that again, Mark? That if the, if the top level, mo if, well, if any module, uh, if, it, if any, any module that does not have any te textual top level awaits in the source code of the module, if that module, whenever that module begins execution, that module, you know, the initialization execution, uh, that module must complete execution in that term. Uh, only a textual await allows an interleaving point. Which yeah, my, my understanding from uh, my limited knowledge on top level await is that that's not the case, that an import uh, if you have a module that has no awaits in it and it imports a module which does have awaits in it, there's an implicit point at which the, the importing module is awaiting the completion of execution of the imported module. Um, but my, my knowledge is not strong on that, so it would be helpful if anyone yeah. else knows about so, that. So this doesn't break everything because uh, the dynamic import expression does return a promise, and otherwise it's unobservable. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's, Every import uh, now makes, uh, makes the behavior observable of whether, whether the behavior is that. Uh, so I, I'm perhaps off base with what top level await even is. Um, I, like the, my intuition would be that the top level await would introduce the notion that you um, well, there are two possibilities of what the semantics of top level are, await are for module authors. Um, on the one hand, it could be that you are required to satisfy your public API um, before your first await, in which case it would be safe for any. That's not the case. And that is not the case. Yeah, which means that which means that uh, that we do need to synchronize that in, an import declaration is always possibly awaited implicitly. So here's a, um, here's a reductio argument or something. I'm not quite sure what, what the form of argument is, but <laughs> um, Michael, Michael Fig and Sala have come to the conclusion that fits with what I think I understand that uh, you can implement the semantics of top level await by turning only the textual await points into yields. Sort of. You also need to be able to load other modules, like the, the child modules, and await their loading before you evaluate the source code of the synchronous module. Yeah, so that I'm would... Sorry. I, I'm sorry, I did, I, did, I did not hear all of that. I did not post so all of that. If, if, uh, if module foo imports A and B and C, 
then top level weight says if A, B, and C are all using top level weight, then they get evaluated in their first tick, all the siblings do, and then they proceed to evaluate, and only after they're done all their top level weights is their module namespace accessible, in which case it can be used for module foo which, as an which, import. Which but is to but, say that, go ahead, Mark. But, but doesn't module, but module foo, uh, can module, if module foo has already started executing. It and, can't until its imports are satisfied. That's, okay. So that's, that's the, that, 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 it isn't that you're translating imports into awaits. It's that you are, no. you are, you are blocking, uh, you are not going to proceed. You're not going to begin the execution of this. Model Correct. And, okay. And okay. Have avoided all of those. Okay. Does, does so, recursive so, module imports uh, affect that if we have loops in the import graph? Uh, they, they're handled some way, but uh, th this is only my naive understanding that is based on what I've read so far. So, okay. There, Clearly we, there's, we all need there's to more details, there. obviously. Yeah, clearly we all need to go off and understand this document. Uh, but having the uh, start module not begin execution until it can run to completion is consistent with the with the constraint that I that I think I understand, um, which is that only textual awaits are interleaving points. It says that that you know all in of the module, the, yeah. Right, yeah. and, which, which which means that we could provide an API that says uh, uh, that that breaks import in the, the synchronous import into a uh, pardon it breaks the asynchronous import into a synchronous execute all of your dependencies and then asynchronous um, execute yourself. But we can't combine those two things safely into a synchronous function. So, uh, so I think this is a good topic to resume on after we've all studied the semantics of top level await. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Could Sounds you paste good. the document into uh, the assess strategy thing too? I, I don't see the, the Zoom meeting. I'm away from my computer. Is this the JS modules determinism versus ASAP? I believe that's what Bradley shared. Oh, okay. This is by Dominic. Um, I'll put this in the uh, public ses. Okay. Yeah, um, this, this, this. yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, I have to take off. So, um, ciao, ciao. Okay, very good. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording. Oh, pleasure to see you all.